on a climate changing rainy day last August, I stood on a cliff top just inside Spain, next to the Passages Memorial to Walter Benjamin, just outside the cemetery where he was buried in 1940. Designed by Israeli artist Danny Caravan and opened in 1994, Passages enclosed a flight of stone steps running down towards the sea in a rectangular iron frame. Toward the bottom, there was a sheet of glass engraved with a shortened version of Benjamin's aphorism from On the Concept of History, and I quote, it is more difficult to honor the memory of the anonymous than it is to honor the memory of the famous, the celebrated, not excluding poets and thinkers. The historical construction is dedicated to the memory of the anonymous. The construction of the iron tunnel acts as a form of projector so that the visitor also sees his or her image projected, as it were, onto the open sea. For a long time, it was hard to see oneself against the imagined background of European fascism, the imperative to never forget, overwriting all other presents and possible futures, turning the projection into a spectre, erased on the always moving waters below. Like the photograph, always already about death, as the Bart Sontag tradition has it. The memorial is memento mori. Such is the posture of the angel of history, condemned to look back at the past. History itself, Benjamin liked to remind us, is Janus-faced. It looks both ways. So if there are the anonymous of the past to be remembered, there are also the anonymous of the present to be named, projected, by the very memorial itself into a different history than the history of great men. This transitory sea writing is not so much photography as photo graffiti, a writing of the self by light that claims the privilege accorded to the name. From the Port Boo Cliffs, you look southwest towards, as it happens, Tunisia. Google Maps representation of that look. In a town called Sidi Bouzid, a fruit seller named Mohamed Bouazizi immolated himself into history as the person in whose name the Tunisian Revolution of 2011 was enacted. In his last preserved writing in 1940, Benjamin noted that in order to preserve the memory of the anonymous, it was necessary that, quote, the epic moment will always be blown apart end quote, or in the words of this convention, exploded. The epic is the account of gods and great men, once memorialized in portraits, now depicted in the ceremonial photograph, such as that of Ben Ali, the only portrait photograph seen in Tunisia in public for the past 40 years. Blown apart, the photograph allows for a photographic common that turns hierarchy inside out and visualizes the present as prologue to a differently visualized future, rather than as the always condemned repetition of the past. In my new book, which is just out, it's called The Right to Look, I emphasize the centrality of such epic understandings of history to the concept of visuality, as formulated first in English by the historian Thomas Carlyle a century earlier in 1840. Here's Carlyle. Carlyle's visuality was the attribute of the hero, leaving the nameless masses with only the right to be led by such a hero. For visualizing was first a military tactic made necessary by the expansion of the late 18th century battlefield. The successful general, such as Napoleon, who was also a hero for Carlyle, was distinguished by his capacity to visualize the battlefield from images, certainly, but also ideas, information, and intuition. As RAQS had it yesterday then, visuality is not apprehended, but imagined. Generalized, as it were, beyond the military, visuality was not a pattern of the visible, but the means by which power visualizes history, a capacity it claims for itself alone. I argue that we can discern a number of complexes of visuality, 
whose function has been to suture authority to power by making it seem natural, right, and hence aesthetic. Carlyle envisaged this function as the enlargement of heroism by what he called, quote, the camera obscura of tradition. In order to, as it were, see these operations of visuality as a colonial technology, it is necessary to situate the work in its places of operation, from the plantation to the colony, now the neo-colony, perhaps even the insurgency. Today, the US military declared that the present variant of the military industrial complex in its intensified form as global counterinsurgency depends on what they call command visualization. This visualization is palpably in crisis, as we all know from our readings of the daily newspapers. Amongst a thousand details, the United States has spent an astonishing $60 billion to try and combat IEDs, which are ex improvised explosive devices. But in so doing, it has not reduced the ratio of the number of bombs set to explosions. By coincidence, it turns out that $60 billion is the amount of money you would need to make college tuition free for every student in the United States. The primary index of the crisis of visuality is, however, the visuality itself is, as it were, visible, that I can talk about it, that I can see it, that we are aware of it. One of the signs from Occupy Wall Street, new paradigm under construction, please pardon the mess. <laughs> it is not then surprising in this context that the people those who were supposed to follow visuality have again become visible and visualized, first in North Africa, then in the Arab Spring, and now across the globe in the form of the Occupy movement. Visuality, as I said, sutures authority to power. It's that form of authority which, as the police, says to us, move on, there's nothing to see here. This is a piece by Oliver Ressler. Only there is something to see, and we know it, and so do they. It's the claim to have the authority to say what there is, and to see it. The Occupy movement is so resonant as a form because it transforms that metaphorical space into a physical one and claims autonomy within it. In his essay defining surrealism as a politics of the everyday, Benjamin says, quote, for to organize pessimism means nothing other than to expel moral metaphor from politics and to discover in the place of political action the 100% image space, end quote. That space of political action centers on the embodied protest, placing a newly affirmed self-image in the street, in the square, in the place of occupation. It challenges the idea that all there is to do is to circulate, to pass by, and continue within the commodity economy at a time when it is entirely obvious that this economy has ceased to function. Just this week, I was told by a police to move on when standing on the street by Zuccotti Park, where Occupy Wall Street is located. I could apparently stand in the park, but not on the sidewalk. The right to look claims autonomy from this kind of authority, refuses to be segregated, and spontaneously invents new forms. The form against which Carlyle so fulminated back in 1840 was the Chartist national holiday, a precursor to the general strike. And here I see a, a node again with RQS and their evocation of Rosa Luxemburg and her celebration of the general strike yesterday. To occupy is in a sense a new form of the ancient occupation of loitering, one of Benjamin's forms of regarding the everyday. In this case, it's that form of loitering codified in 19th century British law as loitering with intent. Known to the British police more recently as sus, or the suspicion of intent to commit a crime. It's what Orwell called thought crime. It's the demand for the impossible, to re-quote again, Judith Butler at Occupy Wall Street quoting the situationists. More precisely, it's the division of the visible and the sayable which is designated as the impossible. So the right to look is a right that one does not have, claimed as if you do. It's a performative action, 
In the context of Todd's recent presentation, one might say it was exemplified by the Madres in the Plaza de Mayo in Buenos Aires, walking around that line that demarcates what there is to see and what we are not allowed to look at over and again in the front of the presidential palace, claiming the right to see the disappeared who were claimed to be invisible. By the organization of pessimism, the anonymous are producing autonomy, the right to look, the right to be seen. A pattern is emerging in which the claim to a self-image morphs into the claim to a collective identity. This is the move from the self-immolation of Mohammed Bouazizi to the collective loss of fear that drove out the pro-Western dictator Ben Ali. It's posting, it's the move from we are all Khaled Said, a Facebook page in Egypt with over 400,000 likes before the beginning of the January 25th movement to the popular declaration that quote, the people want the regime to fall. It's posting an image on we are the 99%, which is a Tumblr site, uh, it's a kind of easy to use blog. This post, I don't know if you can read from the distance you're at, this is by a young woman saying that she's got into the top college in her state, she can barely afford it. If she goes to law school, she'll be $136,000 in debt by her 25th birthday. People have moved from posting on tumblers like this to occupying. So in short, there's a new kind of photography taking place that replaces the camera obscura of tradition with an apparatus to name and organize the anonymous. This kind of photography, so radically distinct from its predecessor that we might call it photography 2.0, is first an extension of the body, whose signature gesture is the young woman photographing herself using her phone at arm's length, like this. This self-portrait is the counter to the ubiquitous surveillance in the age of closed circuit television. It asserts a presence and autonomy from which can be derived the right to be seen and the right to look. Photography is becoming newly democratic beyond its first democratization of the means of mechanical visual reproduction evoked yesterday by Governor Mercer to a democracy of the self and therefore the self image. It's photo graffiti. The emergence of photo graffiti is itself now in process. In Tunisia, the self-styled artivist, which is a word between artist and activist called JR, realized this transformation was happening and produced what he called an inside out visualization of the people as portrait photographs of random individuals printed in poster size and posted as graffiti. I'm showing you an example here, uh, the photograph in the background there, uh, which is actually within the former secret police commissariat in Tunis. This project though was called Artocracy. The photographic commons turned hierarchy inside out and tried to visualize the present as a prologue to a differently visualized future, rather than as the repetition of the past. Working in conjunction with Tunisian bloggers and using all local interlocutors and indeed photographers, the goal was to create a series of 100 portraits of people who had participated directly in the revolution. The photographs were, as you can see, the large scale head and shoulder close-ups in black and white that have become JR's signature style. They're printed as 90 by 120 centimeter posters and they were fly posted across cities in Tunisia, including startling examples like this in the commissariat. And here, uh, they're plastered all over the front of what was once one of Ben Ali's houses. And yes, this actually is a house uh, that he used to live in. But as the documentary that's posted on JR's own website indicates, even this, as it were, open access project was subject to intense criticism within Tunisia. Why only a hundred was the common refrain. For the revolution is widely held to have been the work of the people, not a subset of heroes. No one wants to replace autocracy with artocracy, even as a joke. In Cairo, as we all know, Tahrir Square, which I'm showing you a plan of here, formed the engine of revolution, an image space capable of claiming a future out of the frozen time of permanent emergency. It made clear that the anonymous had forged a political subjectivity 
by co-opting one of the least likely of spaces, an anonymous, irregular space formed between sets of government buildings and usually a jammed traffic intersection. Once the street battle of January 29, 2011, opened the square to the newly formed people, one should forget this is not a, viol a velvet revolution as Western media sometimes like to present it. Nearly a thousand people died in the Egyptian revolution. So after this direct set of confrontations, the square became a hybrid space of active resistance to the dictatorship itself, as well as the public-private care of the revolution and revolutionaries by means of healthcare, food, and media dissemination. I'm showing you here an aerial photograph of the square and those places of care highlighted by those red arrows. The assumption of self-defense, care, education, and sustenance was a declaration of autonomy that made Tahrir into a new political subject which has lent itself to replication around the world. And we've seen this recently. This is Rome, Occupy the Colosseum. This is Madrid, the occupation of the Puerta del Sol, which has preceded the Occupy movement in this country. And here's uh, an anonymous figure renaming the London Stock Exchange as Dahia Square a few weeks ago. In Egypt itself, the contingency artist, and that's his own term, Ganzia, has produced a widely used PDF pamphlet during the revolution on how to conduct a protest. He is now attempting the marathon project of street portraits of all 847 people who died in the revolution. Here are two of those martyr series that are currently visible. However, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces who are now in charge in Egypt persist in painting over these memorials so that Ganzia and his fellow street artists like Kaiser are using the internet as the sole archive of their work. And if you're interested, the website is cairostreetart.com. On that site, you'll see a Google Maps mashup indicating where and when the work was posted. And users are invited to like the link on TwitPic and Flickr, but not now on Facebook because that's too carefully surveilled by the army. But Genzio has only managed to accomplish permanently three of these portraits as of last summer. So it seems unlikely that his martyrology of some 847 will ever be accomplished. One might want to generalize from this, or at least speculate, that the art protest centered on the individual, even when decentered and distributed, taken out of the gallery and into the street, is not yet equal to the visualization of autonomy. And that would derive from the fact that the right to look itself is something that cannot be represented. It is that moment when you look into the eyes of someone else and they look back at you and you invent them and consent to be invented by them. And that look, which we've all experienced, whether it's in trust or in friendship, or if we're lucky, in love, is something that you can't represent the full experience of. And by the same token, I think we don't yet have a means to represent the autonomy of the anonymous. The global occupation movement has now taken the next step to occupy visuality itself. Occupying visuality is not the same as attacking it. That's exactly what visuality expects, and indeed, it arranges its police accordingly. Remember, it visualizes as a battle. It expects to be resisted. To occupy visuality is to think it through from the perspective of the global 99%, from the places of hostile occupation, that is to say, unoccupying such spaces are actually occupied, say, for example, Puerto Rico. Not be easy. Archives and disciplines, as archives and disciplines, are now organized and structured to absorb and accommodate challenges of this kind by what one might now call compulsory interdisciplinarity. In the era of the League Table, the US News and World Report ranking, the research assessment exercise, and on and on, mitigates directly against the possibility of free, open, horizontal research and teaching. A proper preoccupation with such a paradigm would have to engage with the mountain of student debt, its securitization, and exploitative interest rate structure. 
He would need to ask what the relation between employment and education truly should be in a climate change debt destroyed planetarity that can no longer grow its way out of recession. What is the place of critical visuality studies in this strikingly different context? What world do we visualize for ourselves, whether as teachers, students, or citizens? How might we think this future? As Benjamin has taught us, the only resource we have is the past that it continues to exist within the present. It's in unexpunged forms. We need to conceptualize a past in which certain awakenings did not take hold, but were not fully extinguished, that might give us new energies. Now, this is all very grand, you may say. How are we actually to perform the occupying of visuality? Now, there have been many ideas already suggested during the course of this convention, and I'm going to try and give you one more. For over a decade, it's been the fashion for museums and galleries to celebrate those members of the 1% who are lucky enough and generous enough to endow and sustain them. I think here of the Museum of Modern Art reopening in 2005 with a show from the Swiss bank UBS collection entitled, unimaginatively, Contemporary Voices, Works from the UBS Collection. <laughs> that might have seemed like a fine example of noblesse oblige at the time. It looks a little differently now. This is an illustration from the real Wall Street Journal, not the Occupy one. And it shows that UBS has been described by that journal in September 2011 as lurching from crisis to crisis. You may recall that one banker alone at UBS lost over $2 billion in bad trades, causing the journal to lament that bonuses would undoubtedly be affected. But this familiar form of institutional critique, pioneered by the likes of Hans Hacker, Fred Wilson, and Louise Lawler, for all its strengths, is not occupying visuality. Rather, I want to suggest that what we might want to try and do is to visualize those who really created the wealth in the first place. Let's take the example, with all due respect, of this present museum in which we find ourselves, not, I hasten to add, to score any cheap points, but because of all the places I can think of, as I already said, in the art world, the Clark is probably the only one that might even consider doing something like this. Now, it's widely acknowledged in the Clark's promotional materials, which is how I know it, that the fortune that founded this fabulous institution in which we meet was generated by the Singer sewing machine. Here's a typical example from the 19th century. Probably got one of these somewhere in an attic, right? They were invented first in the 1850s, and the Singer was used in the home, but especially in factories. It was itself the object of mass production, and the interface between its commodification and use as a factory tool formed a pattern of globalization, producing opportunities and resistance. Here's a photograph from the canon, if you like. This is Lewis Hine showing single sewing machines in action. I can imagine a certain kind of project, maybe the research exhibition highlighted by T.J. Demos in our first session here, that would visualize that network, tracing the manufacture of the Singer sewing machine from South Bend, Indiana, where there was a major installation, to Clydeside in Scotland, and indeed, St. Petersburg in Russia, and you see them at work here, amongst many other places. In Indiana and on Clydeside, there were major strikes at Singer sewing machine factories in 1899 and 1911, respectively, that shaped labor histories, but also created new visualizations of the emerging global order. On Clydeside, hundreds of workers came out on strike in support of women machinists who were asked to do more work for the same wages. Unlike the similar scenario in the romantic 2010 film that some of you may have seen called Made in Dagenham, the strike was repressed with known unionists being summarily dismissed. Shortly afterwards, the new union, the Industrial Workers of Great Britain, who are affiliated with the Wobblies in this country, visualized their situation as, as you would expect, a battlefront, a direct counter visuality. See the workers, the working class battlefront on the left and the master class battlefront on the right. It's a direct confrontation. 
from here, one gets to the formation of Red Clydeside, key part of the British labor movement and a key player in the general strike of 1926, which one which should know, of course, was uh, rapidly defeated. Now, with that, I don't have time to go into the whole history of this, but let me just quickly fast forward to 1972 on Clydeside. After 50 years of class struggle, the workers at UCS shipyards on Clydeside faced redundancy as the government sought to close the yards in what can now be seen as the first wave of Thatcherism, which is to say the neoliberal regime the, the Occupy movement is currently contesting. Instead of the expected traditional strike, which would have led to a lockout and acceleration of job losses, the unions occupied the shipyard. It's a famous photograph of that occupation from 1972. During the occupation, they did no damage. They continued to work, and in perhaps the most remarkable feat of all, they prohibited drinking amongst the workforce for the whole time of the occupation. They used public opinion, and they saved thousands of jobs. With the possibility of Scottish independence on the horizon, and as jobs disappear daily at the behest of our bankers, you can just read what's going on in Europe day by day as first Greece and now Italy become subject to being called into meetings with the IMF, Obama, and the Troika sitting there dictating the ways in which their countries should be run. It's really quite extraordinary. So we can see a pattern then in which the mapping of wealth creation interestingly leads us first to a classic visuality, the kind of visuality you'd expect to find, the battlefront, and then to occupy visuality. I don't pretend this example is perfect. It's something that I threw together pretty quickly, but it's time to try something else whether in and with institutions or outside of them. So to take, to summarize from the various presentations that we've had, we should occupy art history, we should occupy visuality, we should occupy everything. Thank you. <laughs>